Hi, I'm Marius, and we are Travel Angels. There are 800 female solo travelers who just arrived in India today. So I want you to meet Marilena. Um, she's a 27-year-old corporate professional living in Brisbane, and uh, she wants to see the world. She's interested in going to developing countries. She loves volunteering. And last month, she actually went to um, Delhi. And um, she traveled on her own, and she was living her life. Then everything changed. She got injured. She was ran. She was ran over. She was ran over by a motorbike, and was in urgent need of critical medic uh, medicine assistance. Nobody around her was able to speak English, and nobody around her was care to uh, care to help her. And she ended up waiting on the side of the road for two hours for medical care. So this is common. 500,000 bike accidents happen in India per year. And actually, this is very personal to me, because Marilena is my sister. And, um, and there are, Marilena is like any other woman traveling on her own. It could be your sister. It could be your daughter. It could be your mother. And it could be any other of the four million women who tagged solo travel on Instagram. So I was inspired by the story because um, I wanted to create a team and to create Travel Angel that will prevent Marilena from happening this again. So Travel Angel is a discreet yet fashionable uh, device and Margarita will tell you more about it. So imagine that Marilena had Travel Angel by her side. She arrives in Delhi, she picks it up either from the airport or at every major hotel in Delhi as well. It takes five minutes to set up and pair to your phone, create a profile. And the reason we have a separate device is that your phone can often be unreliable in third world countries, right? We run out of battery, we get um, you know, damage to our phones, or it gets stolen. If an accident happens, all Marilena has to do is press the button for three seconds. She will then get a call from our Travel Angel headquarters, which will assist her with any um, inquiry that she may have. So for example, booking a local doctor that speaks English. If she doesn't answer her phone, however, then it is more grave and our Travel Angels will come out to her uh, based on the GPS satellite location and will be able to assist her. Our travel angels are passionate paramedics that are experts in medical care, post-assault help, theft insurance claims, and rehabilitation. And they will be with Marilena every step of the way, including rehabilitation. Right, Red? Definitely. Travel angel will be at Marilena's side through every single step through the recovery process so that she can go back to what she, do, what she loves the most, to travel. Solo traveling is a new trend, especially so in women. Google Trends show that the searches for this keyword has increased by 100% over the past five years to 100 million. Hey, what's more exciting than that is that they love it and they'll do it again. With a market this attractive, there's going to be competitions out there, right? So let me walk you through some existing options and see where Travel Angels stands and give you the advantage. Currently, there are three kinds of services out there addressing this issue. The GPS tracking only type, the alert only type for friends and family, and the super duper expensive type of personal concierge. So our proposition in this business landscape is to provide you with a high value, affordable, personalized service at your, at when, when you need it the very, very most. Next, we have Chip to talk about some highlights of our business model. Thank you. We believe that um, we are going to address first the Delhi market because Delhi is the largest airport in India. We will need for the start $200,000 to put to, to good use. What are we going to do? We are going to employ a very careful strategy to advertise and market at the point of sale, which is the airport. We believe by making a good use of $200,000, we could break even in the first year with revenues of $300,000, and in the second year, we will be on profit of $150,000 with a sales uh, with the revenues of $600,000.
The next market that we are going to, 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 to go after is the rest of the six major airports in India uh, that would allow us to generate revenues of $1.5 million and um, a net profit of $500,000. $500, then the expansion will go to Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, and we envisage strategic partnership with airlines and not-for-profit organizations. I'll let you, Kevin, to, to tell you more. Plus, the solo travel experts we interviewed and had the testimonials from suggest that solo traveling is actually a huge trend at the moment, and Travel Angel could be a big solution, has a huge market potential. Mike, Mike, Mike. And also, research shows solo travel is the fastest growing tourism segment, and female solo travel has skyrocketed in the last five years. And also, these solo travelers have experience in traveling to developing countries and always had a situation involved in emergencies and <clears throat> problems that could, they couldn't solve themselves. This is where Travel Angels comes in. And we believe Travel Angel could be a good solution to these problems. So we've talked to over 80 women that are telling us that they have had similar um, travel situations where they need Travel Angel. It's not just women though, it's also their families that care about them and a solution like this would make them feel safer about these women going out and making the world a better place. So you're in great hands and we really think that we've been sent from up above uh, with over 50 years combined experience in startups, marketing, entrepreneurship and passion for making the world a better place for these women. So our ask today is for initial seed funding to pilot Travel Angel in Delhi, India, with our um, mission to expand it further. We are looking forward to working with you to provide solo female travelers like Marilena and every other woman out there with the help that they need in the toughest of times. Thank you very much. I've got a question. So I said you, your customer acquisition cost is $16. How much do you make per customer? And, and is the device rental buy or how does that work? Yeah, so the device is picked up when you arrive um, in your destination. We'll also do marketing beforehand. So we'll work with solo traveling influencers. It's a very niche community. And also travel agencies that specialize in female solo travel. So they'll arrive and they'll get that extra reminder. If they forget to pick it up at the airport, they'll have it at all hotels. So the financials? Yeah, I yeah. want a numbers, numbers yeah. question. Great. Yeah, the answer is uh, they would pay 49.95 per week. So the cost of acquisition is $16 and they would pay that amount, which is rather conservative taking into account that the average length of the journey in India is about 10 days. But, but we wanted to be more careful with the, with the projections and we projected for se seven days. How do you build the angels network? Because presumably they're really critical in getting the right people in this group. Absolutely, I can answer that. Um, so our paramedics are local, and I think with the gig economy, um, a lot of people are moving away from working in um, you know, local um, help emergency services, and they want more flexibility. So we'd really tap into the local community of paramedics and trained um, medical health professionals that deal with this and see a gap in the market so they can actually you know, go back to their passions of helping these women um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Sorry, I'm interested in the technology that underpins your solution. Um, so how, are you obviously using an off-the-shelf technology or are the images just indicative? Uh, yeah, we, we are using, um, we're working with specialist suppliers to build out the technology. Um, and considering that in third world countries there's a lot of remote locations, so we have satellite um, separate to your phone that will connect you to the Travel Angel headquarters. And how does acquisition of the technology feed into the, the question that was asked, the first, the first question was asked in terms of your pricing? What portion of your, your um, overhead is technology acquisition? Yep. Um, the, the cost per acquisition for the bracelet is estimated at around $40, which is again conservative because the current price is around $25 to, to $30. 
while the satellite connection for one year of, uh, of subscription is $149, and it fits into the, uh, the business model that we're presenting. Thank you. G'day, my name's Aidan, and straight out of high school, I made a really stupid decision. I thought studying engineering was a wise career choice for me. <laughs> Luckily, I figured this out pretty early and swapped to pharmacy, where my skills are much better suited and much more interesting. However, this mistake still cost me 12 months and $16,000. That's 16 grand I would really like right now to put towards a house deposit. Right now, there are thousands of grade 12 students facing the same issue. Basically, it all comes crashing home when people start walking up to you and saying, hey, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Now, that's a hell of a question, especially when you're only 17. You're already worried about your exams and terrified of all your mates moving off in a couple of months. Just like them, I got this book, which is basically a list of all the different degrees that you can do and one paragraph on each one. Then we went to a career counsellor who was so time poor, you only get about five minutes with him and he only has enough time to say, this is the basic application process. I mean, this is the very definition of an analogue solution to a digital world problem. The problem with this is that obviously you get no depth of insight into what you're about to study. But more than that, you get no human face. You can't visualise yourself in this role at the end of this, at the end of this expensive process. Um, we want to help the kids fix this. There are students out there, just like Aiden, who are frustrated and disgruntled due to the mismanagement of money and the mismanagement of time. There is a fundamental lack of support for high school students looking to pursue higher education. Through our primary market research, 65% of the students we interviewed thought they needed better advice in high school. They felt they were adversely affected by the initial decision and had since chosen to change their degree. Our total addressable market is $123 million, and our primary customers will be secondary schools. The reason for this decision is because secondary schools have a vested interest in the success of their students. The schools are vetted by the governments on demand of graduates that pursue higher education afterwards, which puts their prestige and reputation on the line. High school career counselors often have to look after hundreds of students in their final year, which really impacts the quality, amount, and quantity of advice they can provide to the students. We believe we can help the counsellors provide a personal experience to the students and help them secure their future. We are on a mission to help the students in high school make better career decisions. Our solution is an online web platform where students will be presented with a list of questions about their strengths and interests. These answers to these questions are then fed into our machine learning algorithm, which is already pre-tained with initial data about the students who have been successful in making right career decisions. They are then presented with the recommendations of the kind of courses they can choose from. Once they choose one of them, they are then presented with a list of videos, which will explain them the kind of rigor and the kind of courses they'll have to study in that specific degree. We also have this interface for the high school administration so that they can understand what kind of choices the students are making and help them effectively. We are also considering other options like discussion forums where we will be able to connect them with industry mentors. And we are also considering the data we collect so that we can, universities can target to the right customers. We did some competitor analysis and we found that all these competitors are lacking in two main aspects. Our biggest point is that they don't give the experience how it is in that specific course. So we actually give them enough information about what we'll go through so that they can make better decision. Another very important aspect is the data point that what happens after they choose that decision. Do they drop out of the college? Do they change the course? Or do they continue doing the same thing? We are actually collecting that information back into our machine learning algorithm so that they can make better decisions. We as a team believe in this project. By using future me, students like Aiden who have a better understanding of, of what program to study when they get to university. High schools have a keen interest to make sure that the, this works because this directly impacts their impact, their performance rates. Also, 
Just last year, the government int introduced a cap on the borrowing because government-funded education actually exceeded the $50 billion mark for the first time in history. This presents a unique window of opportunity for us, and this market is very attractive for our beachhead. In terms of our business model, we intend to capture just a small frac fraction of this value. We are in a business-to-business -business space, so our, the high schools will be our economic buyer, and the students will be the final end user. We're going to use, utilize a subscription model whereby we are charging $4,500 to, to each high school. And each high school we get as a customer, this represents $8,000 worth of profit. And comparing that to a cost of customer acquisition of uh, less than $1,000 as we go, as we look into the long term, we believe that this is a sustainable business. Our decision-making unit consists of four main groups. The students that are the end users, the parents that are the influencers, the schools that are the end users and the economic buyer, and the government that's an influencer with veto power. Through our decision-making process, we aim to engage these stakeholders through workshops and networking. We also have two additional stakeholders, industry experts and university students who'll help us create our video content. And then there's us. Why are we the best team to tackle this job? Well, with our expertise in the technical area between me and Gagan's engineering experience, we can tackle this solution. We have the business mindset into Kunda and Aiden's experience and the consulting and stakeholder management experience in Harry's brilliant brain. Our value comes down to Aiden's story at the beginning. How many of you guys experienced this in high school? I want you to think about your experiences, about the hardships that you came in trying to make this decision. And how, how many... It, how much resources did you have to be able to do that? And were you supported on your journey? When we spoke to teachers, they told us that students report getting key benefits when they're presented with their personalised options and have the freedom to go and explore them. And that's what our platform does. It provides that clarity for students during a busy time of their lives, while also aiding teachers who are, are under-resourced and trying to fit all of this into a jam-packed curriculum. So if you want to be part of, if you want to inspire the next generation of students, Come and talk to us and be a part of the journey that is Future Me! That's actually, well, I had the mic in my hand, but that's literally one paragraph of each course we uh, Thanks for the pitch, that, that was really good. Um, I definitely see the problem. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Um, yeah. I'm just curious, I actually have a lot of questions, but one is your validation on the school side. So you talked about validation on the student side, you talked a lot about the student problem, but you are actually selling to the schools. How did you validate that? Um, so I went and talked to a few different teachers and school counsellors about what struggles they see their students go through and the types of problems that they come across. So that's how we got some of the information that they're trying to engage all of these students um, through a lot of activities, but it's hard to fit it into the curriculum. So that's why we kind of went down this road for our solution because it, en it enabled the school counsellors to give more personalised service to the students while fitting into something that was already really packed and full. And it, our solution just aims to make life a lot easier for these two people. Did you actually pitch a price point to the school? 4,500 per year per school. And did you get feedback on that? Did you get validation of that? That was point? based off a $30 per student price. Um, and then we averaged out the number of students and schools and I worked out about 150 average grade 12 mm -hmm. per school. But the schools are getting measured on this. They're getting metrics and assessed by the government. Um, and they already have a budget for this sort of future learning for counsellors. Um, just to add to that, we spoke to some people who are already in this market and providing services to schools in terms of providing mentorship and internship opportunities, and they're providing around that price point to schools at the moment as well. If no one else has a question, I'll keep asking. Um, where do you see yourselves in the future? Because to me, th this concept of um, you know, going and doing a six-year degree is pretty much dying. Like we're, we're shifting to micro degrees and six careers in a lifetime, and it's actually more about understanding yourself, not the options. So where do you see the future of this? So this is a minimum viable product. Um, this is where we saw the earliest way to break into the market. After this, we're looking to expand basically into the corporate world. We'd like corporate advertisers to put their career paths next to the uni degrees, so they can attract talent straight from high school into there. Okay. 
I've got one more. The key buyers here are uh, your schools, which you've done a rough 150 bucks a head, and you, you, you then share that that's come out, um, that you've got there's money for this. Universities are changing. They're going to micro-credentials and things like that. So um, I think you might need to think a little bit more about the, um, the way you engage with them because there's the, the opportunity sits between those two players, I think. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your, your discussions with the unis about where you think the value is in. Why would they buy? Why would they get involved yeah. with We this? spent a long time thinking about are we charging students for this? Are we charging high schools or are we charging unis? And when I was speaking to the university councillor down at HiQ there, they were really positive. <laughs> Good morning. Meet Raj. He's a 21-year-old engineering student in computer science at a private university in New Delhi in India. He comes from a middle-class family, but he spent most of his life playing video games like most people at his age. But now he's a year away from graduation, and he knows he needs to find a job, and he knows he doesn't have the skills for it. He also doesn't want to make the mistake his peers have made in the past where they have tried to take many online courses and never found the perfect fit. As I said, he's from a middle-class family, so his family is really looking forward to him getting a good job and being able to support the family. 95% of computer engineering graduates in India are not fit for software development jobs. Now, 80% of our market agrees with that statement and is working to overcome this. The problem of this is for two main reasons. Number one, these students do not know where their skill gaps lie compared to their peers. Number two, they also don't know which courses will fill the skill gaps that are, the industry sees as gaps uh, due to the increased amount of content out there for them. Enter MyMent. MyMent is an online learning platform. So when Raj, baffled with a lot of choices like all of us have been, comes to our platform, we create a profile for Raj. We ask him based on a lot of questions. For example, do you like experiential learning more? Because we believe that every student has a personal learning path and he should not be put in a system that makes him study what everybody else is studying. We believe every student is different in a way that some students study more on the weekends, some study more on the weekdays, some like a lot of us here right now study seven days before the exam and still want to crush it. A lot of us are in this space, so which means when we start building platforms and when, when we start building profiles for students, we explore their learning patterns. We also collect data around this, which means how much time they spend on videos. Do they skip a lot of videos, which means they're not really getting through a lot of content. We create personalized learning plan based on these. How we create these plans is we go through all of the content that is freely available on the internet, which means the student does not pay at all. We go through the freely available content. From that content, we give him a recipe, a recipe that will make him successful. At MyMent, we believe what you do decides where you go. And at MyMent, your past is your future. According to research in the online education learning space, Students that come to online learning platforms to study what they are really interested in take over 20 hours of research over 60 days. That's two months lost just trying to find what you're going to study. At MyMent, you create a platform and we give you what you should do, what you should focus on, 20 minutes, one day. This platform now also tells you what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, where you should be focusing, projecting to your employers your strengths, building on your weaknesses so you can make yourself better every day. Compete with your peers by collecting MyMent scores. These MyMent scores help you get a lot of competition going on in your community. Also, a great thing that they do for us is the students that collect higher MyMent scores are also eligible to buy more learning plans from us, which means they study more from us, give us more data. So they make their own learning plan more personal, more accurate to them. So let's talk some business.
Um, our business model is consumption-based model. It means provide flexibility with our customer to kind um, to uh, adapt uh, uh, their learning plan based on their need. So we start with one, link, one learning plan with ten dollar, three learning plan for twenty-five dollar, and five learning plan for forty dollar. We did also uh, a little bit of research market. So there are some competitors available in the market. Uh, but what we believe, we are providing or meeting the two most uh, important uh, priorities of our targeted users, uh, personalization and affordability. On the top of that, we have a platform which is gamified, meaning they can compete, they can compare with their uh, peers. We provide them with the cross-platform content, online free uh, contents, but with the best uh, quality based on their need, and they can save some time. 20 hours to 20 minutes. So it's important to mention that uh, we have proven that this business model is financially sustainable. In the first year, we went to reach at least 35 customers, giving us at least 1.3 million of revenue. Due to our market strategy and also our sales expenses, we went to reach at the year five more than 250,000 customers uh, that will bring us nine, uh, $9 million of, of expected revenue. Uh, so, diving deep into our lifetime value and our cost of customer acquisition, at the first year, due to our sales and marketing expense, our cost of customer acquisition is quite high. However, during the years, these costs will decrease uh, based on our network effect. At year five, we went to reach a ratio between our, our lifetime value and our cost of customer acquisition at seven, which seems really incredible. Our international team have all had the same problem. We've all wanted to know where we need to study to improve our skills to meet our industry needs. We all also have 50 hours, I'm sorry, excuse me, 50 years of experience across development, <laughs> AI, uh, design, marketing, and finance. So let us help you find the best programs and courses to study to meet your industry needs and fill your skill gap. We're my men. Thank you. So thanks guys, that was a great presentation full of energy which is amazing given what you've all been through in the last few days. Um, I'm really interested in understanding how you arrived at your pricing model. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you built that? Oh, the pricing models. So we have a consumption-based pricing, which means once the user buys the first plan. So, for example, I'm a new user and uh, I've just come... Sorry, I'm going to just cut in there. I, I understood the pricing model, but how did you arrive at $10 per module, for example? You know, what, yeah. what was the basis of that decision? Yeah, I'll take it. Sorry. Uh, so we basically try to understand the market. So I've, I've studied in India, so I kind of understand what a student would be ready to pay for a learning plan. So that's the reason we went for like the $10 plan, because we know 500 rupees is like something that they would be ready to pay or 600 rupees. And we also went for $25 because we thought that's what they would be really interested in. Because most students are ready to put up an amount of, say, close to 1,000 to 1,500 rupees, which is that range of $25. And they're, they're happy with spending that much. Beyond that is a bit of a far-fetched thought or something that we just, we just put the other plan out there for them to think about. But our main target area is that $25 because, yeah, most, most courses online right now, even if you have a look, Coursera or any of these other courses, they, they charge somewhere around 2,000 to 3,000 rupees, so, which is around 50 to $60. So that's the reason we kind of priced it in this manner. Also, uh, to add to that great point, uh, I've worked at Udacity for a couple of years myself. And one of the key things that we had was our pricing was too high. So to deal with that, uh, when you know pricing is lower, we're not bringing in another economic buyer in the picture, which means if the pricing goes to $1,000, their parents will have to pay for it at that age. So this is a decision that they can make with their own pocket money. They don't have to involve too many people. They can try and test it out, and then maybe ask for money for larger plans from their parents. Uh, thanks, guys. That's uh, a great presentation. Look, the, the, the piece I'd like to understand a bit more is the, the key differentiator, I think, that you put up, and that is this personalised learning plan. Can you talk a little bit about how you think you're going to develop that in a way that's not, you know, human being intensive? 
so there are two ways to it. First, we will go through all of the free course content that is freely available on websites like Udacity and Coursera. So their core is basically they want to do growth models with, uh, you know, throwing out a lot of free course content over there. We take all of those free course modules, we run algorithms on them for behavioral insights. So when, you know, for example, a teacher is teaching, is he teaching with more examples? Is he teaching with a lot of funny content in the middle? Is he teaching too fast? Is he teaching too slow? Once we have those attributes for a video, and we know what the title of a video is, for example, it's uh, R programming or front-end programming, then we ask a survey to the student at the start of building his profile. Are you more into experiential learning? Are you more into example-based learning? What kind of learning are you in? If he answers X, and we find that that video matches him in the space of the subject that he wants to do, we put it in his learning plan. That's the first step. Second, as and when he progresses, if Sitting is the new smoking. Did you know that 80% of office workers have been plagued by back pain? This leads to mental and physical trauma, costing employers $3,000 per employee annually, billions of dollars in medical expenses and legal fees. And guess what? The billions spent on ergonomic technology just isn't working. And do you know why? Bad posture. Now, can you just, no, next slide. This is me. This is pretty bad, I know this, but that is how I guess every one of us is sitting. So I've been doing this new smoking past eight years, sitting eight hours a day, and guess what? It has led to a severe, severe back, prop, back pain. Doctor suggested a one week of complete bed rest, but then I had to get back to work, and this time I have to make sure I sit properly in right posture. But do I sit in right posture? Maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, sit upright, but then again, slouching back in. And that's going to again, get, get back the back problem again. So I looked, up, uh, I looked across the solutions. I tried ergonomic chairs, wasn't helping it because I sat on ergonomic chair, again, slouching back in tried standing desks. I was standing, but then again my legs hurt. I was back into the ergonomic chair. Curious enough, I contacted my friends and we researched 28 Australians near the government offices. And out of 28, 21 reported back problems. And we were curious, what were they doing about the solution? They were using smartwatches, they were using Fitbits, some wearables, but nothing really helped. So we as a team with robotics engineer, marketing manager, financials and sales expert, and software development experts, we have come up with the most innovative and the smartest chair, Ergotech. This is how it works. The employee arrives to the office and he sets up and adjusts the chair to his preferred position. Next day, he or she arrives to the office again and with a RFID card, taps the ergo chair, and it comes to its preferred position. Ergo chair has sensors that measure your back, your legs, and the motion while, while you are seated. The information is gathered and sent to our software platform. And based on, a, on, your, on the time of your city position and our proprietary algorithms, it sends you an alert, or it finds a, a well-balanced working position move, moving itself. This is, uh, this is our key component. Ergo chair is able to measure your breath patterns. It's scientifically proven that breath is correlated to position. If you, if you have a good position, you will improve your health. And then you extend the quality of your life. So you will live longer. I have experience in engineering and robotics we are able to give you a reliable and good quality MVP, and then we can scale with this. So why Ergo Chair? Well, the Ergo Chair um, provides benefits for both the employer and the employee. From an employee's point of view, um, 
The yoga chair, the yoga chair ensures you are ergonomically seated regardless of which chair in the office you use. Um, through maintaining uh, correct posture, health problems associated with back pain are mitigated using this technology. In addition, quality of life um, is improved for the employee as well as um, uh, health expenditure of the employer is reduced. For corporations and employers, um, healthier employees lead to less um, lost time um, due to sick days. And uh, through keeping, um, keeping employees comfortable at their desk, increased productivity and therefore revenue. For any of you working in a revenue-based uh, uh, time-based revenue company, you understand what I mean. For context, in Australia, um, back pain results in approximately 20,000 um, workers' compensation claims annually. This um, uh, results in uh, estimated profit profitability loss of approximately $8 billion a year. Um, and just think about that, that's 20,000 uh, um, workers' compensation claims and $8 billion lost, and we can mitigate that. The final, finally, the ergo chair actively measures and records an employee's position um, in, a, in the chair. Um, and through using this data, we can modify, or we can... Um, we can um, identify employees, uh, identify employees we can identify employees whose posture is suffering and intervene before it becomes a major issue. Um, so where are we going to start? Well, when we begin this company on March 1, 8, March 1 the first, our first point of call is 1 William Street, where Jackson Gerard, the director, one of the directors at the Department of State Development, has told us that a chair like this is something he desperately needs in his life. Now, one William Street contains 5,000 state government employees, a government committed to advancing Queensland and, um, and cementing Brisbane as a smart city. And it is uh, smart buildings like one, uh, one William Street and smart cities like Brisbane that need smart chairs. And this is why we want to start here. Um, advancing Queensland starts from the bottom up. So. I'm sure it costs about $1,000. The manufacturing cost is going to be about $400. And we're going to spend about another $100 acquiring customers because it's going to be a B2B. So we're looking at a profit at the year three. And then our expansion plan is right now we're at a phase of design and research. We're going to launch in 2020 and we'll start exploring our markets when we have the money. So. We need $500,000 to t take it from research and development to production. Thank you. Speaking as someone who spent far too long in front of screens, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, have you spoken to the people that see the people with sore backs, the chiros and the osteopaths and everybody else, and what did they tell you? So the thing is, um, we have spoken to people. We even brainstorm about people who sit in the car and then, you know, bad couches at home. You know, there's a lot of places where we can go, but this is a good place to start because they spend a lot more time doing something really serious, and those other things are fun. You can play, it can be sitting down in a wrong posture at home. Sorry, sorry, I'll just cut you short. Sorry. Did you speak to chiropractors and osteopaths who deal with people with bad backs? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, no, we haven't taken advice from a doctor. I can tell about my own experience. I have back problems. Next, uh, after Australia, I will arrive to Peru, uh, have a surgery on my back. I will spend $10,000 for that because I didn't care of my back. Uh, during three years, I've, I've been in pain. Just working, continue, but... I'm 40, I'm not invisible, uh, invincible anymore, so I have to pay for that. I will pay $2,000 for that, just to save this money and feel better. 
Speaking as a master slumper, that I'm sure we all sat up as you presented, um, does the chair keep adjusting until I don't slump anymore? So I can answer that question. No, it doesn't. The idea is that the chair will be ergonomically set up for you, and then you can pick any chair in the office when you come back, and it will automatically adjust that position. Now, it notifies you through sensors um, that your posture is bad, you're slouching, and that, that I suppose, helps to change your behaviour and encourage you to sit properly. It's human machine machines working together. Because it has smart electronics with uh, R&D, we can program it to a reasonable, a, a, reasonable, a reasonable frequency of change on time. So we have to do some tests with that. So I just had a comment to make. Lloyd, sometimes the hardest thing is to keep going when you get a bit stuck. So well done. That was, that was very courageous. Um, well done. Um, I guess my question is, you know, what does the average office manager spend on a chair now? Do you know that? And is this a big jump? Um, from our PMR, it's uh, between eight hours to 14 hours. For work only people like me, it could be 16 hours. No, I think sorry, they pay for a chair. chair. A costable chair, okay. So from the research we obtained, it was around $500. We've come to, I know some companies spend less, but um, within our target demographic, it'd be around $500. So, they are so does that reduce your total addressable market? And have you factored that into your modeling? So we modeled um, in a couple of ways. The first thing is the heavy spenders are going to be people moving in, in new offices. If it's a brand new office, they're ready to spend a little more. If it's an old office, it's going to take some time for them to come back. You are going to die. It might not sound like a very nice way to put it, but statistically speaking, you're guaranteed to die someday. I'd like to introduce you to Shalini. Shalini is a 37-year-old married working mother with two kids. She cares about her family and wants to guarantee their future, though she doesn't have a will. Due to Queensland's state legislation, if she were to pass away, her spouse Frank would be left with just $150,000 to raise their two children whilst her remaining wealth, including her superannuation, would be held in a trust until her kids are 18. Complications like this can be prevented with a will, though frighteningly, 50% of Australians die without one. So, are they difficult to get? Well, not really. A quick Google search shows that wills can be obtained from post offices, websites, and lawyers. So why aren't people doing them? We dug a little deeper and found the answer was far more existential than we first thought. People don't make wills because it's an acknowledgement of their own mortality. It's natural to perceive the thought of your own death as uncomfortable or negative, and we want to change this. We think it's possible to turn the notion of death into a motivational tool. To do this, we need to change the mindset from mortality to legacy. Uh, there is a huge market for this problem. Statistics shows there are 12 million Australians without a will, which is the half of the population, as Jackson mentioned. Uh, for, uh, uh, from our analysis, this, put, this puts uh, at the, uh, the total addressable market $1.5 billion. We have also analyzed our decision make, uh, we have also analyzed this decision making units, uh, identifying that Shalini is the target customer. She is the economic buyer and user, also the champion. In, the, in making decisions for this problem, Shalini has several factors to consider. She needs to find something affordable so that she can buy within budget. But Cheap solutions on the market do not, give her, do not give her trust or engagement. However, if she wants a huge level of trust and engagement, a will provided by a lawyer is a lot more expensive and inconvenient to arrange. As you see, there is a, <coughs> there is a gap in the market to provide solution. So, our solution is an online platform that called Legacy.me. And now Shalini can create a will easily. And also Legacy.me has, has features that can, uh, cannot accessible for other platforms. These are like 
Shalini can store a will or important documents on the platform that they, uh, she can attach a video message. When the circumstances change in her life, she can update a will easily. Uh, if she wants, she can uh, leave the capsule to her son and her son can access it to special days. And we also provide easy, uh, easy referrals to her lawyers if she felt like she needed legal advice. From our research, we identified two triggers for our target market. First of, first of all, we found that people created a will when they planned a travel, travel overseas and is exposed to additional risks. We also found that the arrival of a new baby creates a desire to plan his well-being. So our customer's life cycle starts with two triggers, overseas travel and having a baby. The absence of a will results results in them researching options and try to understand how to process the setting one up. So, and we see that they make, her, they make their decisions based on affordability and engagement. As August has articulated there, our solution has a number of features that is not currently available uh, on a single platform today. Legacy.me is not just a service to get a, a will but one that will start Shalini on her journey of building a legacy for um, her children. The digital storage and time capsule capabilities are designed so that Shalini can store the small or big things in her life that she would like to share with her children in the future. In addition to the technical features of the platform, Shalini has access to a concierge service um, if she ever needs any guidance along the way. Legacy.me is the solution for Shalini to begin building her legacy that she wants to leave, as well as ensuring that she has a will should anything bad happen to her. Going to a lawyer will cost Shalini $2,000. In contrast, our service will have an upfront fee of $99 and a $30 annual fee to capture the value that we create for them. Drawing from experience from other projects, we estimate our gross margin to be 90% and retention rate at about 80%. So our customer lifetime value, we, price, we put it at about $145. We intend to reach our customers via two channels, online and via partners. From the online channel, we will be uh, investing in optimized search engine results and also in, uh, spend on search engine marketing. Um, we will also hire business development managers that will create partnerships with uh, professionals that have access to our target market. We forecast 36,000 new customers in our first year and a 20% growth year each year. And, and our customer acquisition cost will start at $40 in our first year, halving by over time over the five year period. To that, our ratio to, from our cost to value ratio is about 3.6. As Jackie noted, we believe the financials stack up for this business. However, for us, it's not only about the financials. For us, it's about people like Shalini and her family and providing a solution for them. As a team, we believe that we have the skills care and the drive to make this platform a reality. We have a variety of experience in a diverse range of areas, including an estate planning expert, uh, software, finance, engineering, marketing, and product management. To help us create this future, we're asking for $2 million for early stage development, marketing, and sales costs. Now it's up to you if you want to be part of this legacy. Where there's, there's a will, will there's, there's a way. way. Really good pitch. Um, I enjoyed it, and I, I understand the problem. My wife is actually a wills and probate lawyer, or was, so I, I get the problem you're trying to solve for. Um, but that gives me a lot of questions. I, I'm going to pick on your LTV. See, LTV is $145, but your sign-up price is $99, and your recurring is $30. That means you're only counting on them staying for like 13 months. Can you explain where you got that from? Sorry, I'm the CFO, and in general, in the MIT bootcamp, we use a project. We use a very, very high discount rate. We use a 50% discount rate because uh, investors require a high rate of uh, return in order to um, 
for the high risk of a startup. Also, our projections usually with the 50%, it means that really after five years, we the income really is quite insignificant, so we only project over five years. Therefore, our LTV is not that high because we use a very, very conservative um, rate of return. Okay, so it's the way you were taught to do it. <laughs> okay. All right. I have more questions otherwise, unless you guys want to go. <laughs> um, so my other question, so, so the problem you're solving for is, is sort of like gyms that want to sign up unhealthy people. It's really hard to activate them, right? Your way of doing it is to add this new service. Why not just do the new service, like just the legacy, and drop the wheels from it completely? Like the digital legacy is actually really valuable. That's been proven by validation. Why do you need wheels? Um, from our research, there, there are time capsule companies and a few companies trying to do similar sort of things, I guess. You know, for us, bringing the two markets together actually creates a bigger business, we think, in the longer, longer, longer term. So I think it's a great idea um, and a good job on identifying the, the opportunity. I guess my question to you is, of those, I think you said 12 million people in Australia that don't have a will, do you have any understanding of what proportion of those would be attracted to a product like this? Um, yeah, look, we don't really have an answer for that one, to be honest. We couldn't really like, um, draw that out of our research. Um, but obviously, like, we did pitch the idea to a lot of people that we did um, the primary customer research with, and they, and they said, yeah, we'd be interested in it. So, um, yeah, I can't really give you an accurate figure on that one, sorry. And if no one else is going to say it, love the T-shirts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And saying that though, so there's three certainties in life. There's uncertainty, death, and tax. Lucky you here, lucky for us. I'm Ash, and we, the team at Spine, are here to help small to medium-sized businesses straighten out their books with no hooks. We are an artificial intelligence software which integrates directly into CCTV and existing cloud accounting software. This will promote Oh, sorry, this promotes and brings autonomy to the system, removing errors of manual input. Some of you from previous pitches might remember John. John actually got arrested for tax evasion. So we had to go back out and we had to find Greta. <laughs> Greta here is a successful business owner and, and she proudly owns the establishment, which is Fire and Rock. Greta operates outside the law, would you believe it or not? She does this by using cash payments and in doing that, she, um, so she uses cash payments to underpay her employees. By this, she dodges paying tax, she dodges paying superannuation, she dodges, oh, and the cherry on the, I, the icing on top is that she doesn't pay holiday pay either. So if someone, a federal authority such as the Australian Tax Office or Fair Work were to come and have a conversation with Greta, It'd sound something like you're up for a minimum fine of about 60k, and you're up to you're up for a maximum fine of up to and beyond 600k. For hundred dollars a month, Greta could put herself in the predicament where she wouldn't have to worry about this. I'll now hand over to Nick to dig into this problem a little bit further. Thanks, Ash. So research by the Australian government into small business uh, engagement shows that more than 12,000 small to medium uh, size uh, restaurants do not have adequate systems that are efficient and effective. Further to that, 5,500 small to medium restaurants are not confident uh, in their management of tax and super. We've gone out and we've talked to managers in the industry and they've voiced their frustrations about um, uh, yeah, about handling complex payroll systems uh, and processes. We then talked to employees working in the restaurant industry and we found that more than 50% um, of those employees are paid in cash, uh, paid, yeah, paid cash in hand, making it more difficult for these businesses to be compliant. So we can see that there's a real need in this market for innovation in addressing the problem of cash payments for wages. Now I'll pass over to... 
Marcela, to take us through the pain points of this. Thank you. So we've all heard it from Nick. The real problem relies on complying just being way too hard on the, res on the restaurant business. They don't know how to do it. There's already more than 12 apps trying to get businesses to get on track with this problem. But they're just not doing the job. Why is that? Most comments just say that the, the, the process already there are not fully integrated and are not very user-friendly or reliable on the information. So basically, it comes, down to, it comes down to three words, to three needs. Reliability, integration, and a work-alone system that will go the, all the way until the payment process. When we talk about market, we take into account the 29% of restaurants that are not complying as of today. But when talking to people and understanding our customer, we did realize that the restaurant, the restaurant owner wasn't taking the decision on her, herself. She has this guy, he's very trustworthy, he's, he's, uh, he's her accountant, and she basically relies on him. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Mark, I'm the chartered accountant for the business. And I'll just explain to you why Greta was unable to comply with the uh, employment regulations. Uh, as you can see from the chart, uh, this is the flow chart of a, payroll, of, of a typical uh, payroll process. It's highly complicated and requires hours of manual input. It also requires specialist knowledge about the national employment standards as well as the Restaurant Modern Award. Within the Restaurant Modern Award, there are over 100 minimum wages rates. There's dependent on each level of the employee, as well as the time when he worked, as well as the day that he worked. So you've got to apply them individually as per your application. So we, we believe that the solution to this issue for a typical business owner who has to go through all this information and make it his own it's extremely difficult. So the answer is payroll automation. It takes away the complexity of the issue and saves time and costs for the business owner. And how are we going to achieve this? From the asset state, the, the payroll process model, we're going to transform it into a fully automated payroll system by utilizing the underutilized asset which is a CCTV system within the restaurant, you'll find that most restaurants already has a CCTV system. It collects timesheet information, it processes and pays employees automatically. I'll pass on to Justin, who will now talk about the business. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our market research and calculations indicate that the customer lifetime value is about $1,050. The cost of customer acquisition over a five-year period is, uh, starts from $500 in the first year, but improves on to $50 in the fifth year. This, is due to, this, is, this can be analyzed by analyzing the sales and marketing costs and our improving customer base. So what happens to Greta? Business owners like Greta have a limited time to comply with federal laws after their first offense. There is a need for these businesses to comply. There is a need for quick, simple, and integrated solution to ease their payroll system. There is a need for Spine. So join us, the team at Spine, in helping business owners like Greta keep their books in check. Let's uplift the workers who are exposed to the cash economy, get fair wages, and tr equal treatment. So I'm wondering, as a restaurant owner, there's so many of them that are uncompliant. How much of a pain is there really for them? I mean, there's lots of them are doing it. Had you looked at other ways to incent them to do that, like bundling it, say, with an employee scheduling thing, which takes away a, a much more immediate paid for them? Well, uh, I can actually answer that for you. Uh, I'm actually a chartered accountant in real life as well, and I work with a lot of small and medium businesses. And uh, 
Thanks to Fair Work for making the restaurant work so difficult. Uh, a lot of restaurant owners are actually my clients, and quite a common theme occur across these uh, restaurant business owners is that they know how to cook, but have no, absolutely no accounting background. Uh, they want to improve the process. They've recently migrated to Australia with an Asian background. But trying to understand the regulations or the complexity of the process around it is really difficult for them. I've tried various methods through training, uh, providing them with um, similar other payroll solutions out in the market at the moment, but they just find the learning too difficult. The regulations are a bit too onerous as well. So having had multiple discussions, I think the possible solution, I think I believe, is fully automation software. To add to what Mark said, like we are currently exploring the future possible avenues, but this is a window of opportunity that we have found because uh, the ATO has actually begun, like in the past three years, they've employed 100 people to actually make the crackdown. And this is a window of opportunity that takes us to the beachhead market, and we'll take it from there. So those products you looked at as competitors aren't doing the automation process? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. No, they're not. And the beauty of our system is that it integrates into the existing products. And then if they're not satisfied, then another window of opportunity for us is to also develop a software which integrates with our software. And then we can kind of flush through the whole system and just use Allspine. So was part of your market plan to work with them or to try and go directly to the, the customers? No partnerships, just simply plug and play. Right. Um, and then, you know, that may stir, and it'll give us an early jump, and it may stir them to catch up to us, but by then we can already be looking at integrating into what they're doing and hopefully sweep them through that sort of uh, past five years. And uh, just to add to that as well, we've looked at current providers that automate that says you will make your payroll convenient and simple, but uh, I've recommended it to my clients, they, but it's still a learning exercise for them. They're still required to set it up as per the restaurant or they are still required to spend hours of manual input into those systems, nonetheless. Um, a very fine afternoon, actually, a very fine morning to all of you. Um, we at Buddy are, are actually making some uh, improvements in uh, taking the first step, which you all will understand what I mean by that. Uh, but before that, I would like to use this wonderful opportunity to tell you a small story about a very close friend of mine, Nidhi. Nidhi, like most of us from India, like wanted to actually pursue grad school uh, with a lot of passion. And she did really well in her academics back in India, and she got into a very good school in Australia. But then, the happy Nidhi that you see in this picture, her happiness was extremely short-lived. To her dismay, the whole concept of cultural differences, the language barriers, and other things that an international student undergoes, like when he or she is studying abroad, that caused a lot of anxiety and led to a lot of mental uh, instability in her head. She felt extremely lonely. She started feeling a sense of depression. When, she, when, when I was on the call with her during April or May, if I can remember correctly, she was telling me that she's not really comfortable in opening up to people or opening up to counseling centers on campus. This is where Buddy comes in. But then, it's not just Nidhi. Australia alone has about 640,000 people, students coming in every year, out of which, 323,000 people have mental illness. This is a serious concern. And out of this number, around 20%, according to our market research, actually prevent themselves from going to counseling centers. This is the problem we are trying to solve. Buddy is a, Buddy is a customer of well-being. Buddy is a personalized well-being assistant that helps international students who are suffering from anxiety and depression take that first step. Now, it's important to be clear that Buddy is not meant to be a replacement for health professionals or student advisors within the university. 
Instead, what Buddy is, is a subscription service that universities can use to help create safe spaces for their international students to learn um, well-being techniques and routines, develop a sense of belonging, and also be guided to the right experts and information in a space free of judgment and free of cultural stigmas. So here are two of our key additional features. We have multilingual support, which help our client universities make their students feel right at home and be able to convey those finer emotions in their own language. Next, we have our uh, connector program. This connector program pairs senior international students with income international students and also at-risk international students. A, study, a recent study has shown that such a program has the capacity to increase international students' experience in terms of the sense of belonging and also interactions with community by up to 20%. Our primary, uh, in addition to this, a national inquiry into student, international student experiences in Australia has also told us that one third of students, when they come to university in Australia, they're confronted with this. Um, a third of them would love to access these um, services, and if they were made aware, they would, but they only learned about these services when they were interviewed. Um, our primary market research also indicates that even when they do try to approach for help, they're often bounced back and forth between uh, different departments in the services. This is a headache for the university as well, and a costly one. Um, sometimes they have to uh, onboard additional staff during peak season that uh, costs around 60K per year for one staff member. And it's not optimized, it's not streamlined. And this is costing the university time, money, and it's also potentially costing lives. We have looked into the statistics of international student services across 38 universities in Australia. And we found that they collectively spend almost $37 million every year on student services. We buddy think that we can create a value of 55% considering not just international students, but also domestic students. And our total market, our total our market is $20, $20 million. Um, once we start expanding to other countries, we will be projecting it to the $2.4 billion, which is a huge market. Um, unfortunately, uh, recently in uh, University of Melbourne, the two international students who attempted suicide, uh, this could be because they have a lot of depression and loneliness and they don't have anyone to talk to. And we, we see this as a window of opportunity to actually help the students because we care as much as universities care. So, talking our, about our competitors, there are quite a few apps that help people to uh, in need uh, when they are in stress or when they are in depression. And uh, there are apps like Talkspace, which help uh, people to connect with uh, uh, psychologists uh, using the internet. Uh, they can uh, video conference with them. And we have some like Webot. Uh, that's an AI-enabled chatbot that will help people in need. And this is the thing we are developing, buddy. The difference is that they do not cater for the needs of university students. They do not have, connect with the services of university students to give the exact information they need. And actually, uh, using talk space, people do not want to directly go uh, use the talk space because people find it quite uneasy. People from Nepal and places like India and some other places, uh, due to our culture, uh, we don't, do not try to open up uh, about our problems. So, Actually, Buddy comes in, it have, the AI helps to ease the problem, and then they can connect them to the mentors that actually care about them, not to any stranger. And they speak the same language, and they can help people in need. So to implement our solution, Buddy will be sold to universities um, as an yearly subscription. At $18 per student, the total cost for a university each year would be around $300,000. And this saves the university about $600,000 in their spending for counseling and student services. So as we start out, we aim to acquire three universities each year, and we would be investing in sales expertise as well. And we've seen that the lifetime value of the customer uh, is about three times the value of customer acquisition costs. Next slide, please. So we at Buddy are a, are a multidisciplinary team 
with a collective experience in design, software engineering, and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial experience. We are passionate ab about student well-being, and we want to help students help themselves take the first step. Thank you. Quick numbers question. If I heard correctly, you said that you want to charge around about 300K for an average uni and they, who would, they spend about 600K. That's yep. a big ask to get 50% of that, of that budget. How are you going to do that? Um, so we did some research about how much, how, how much universities already spend on student services and wellbeing services. And it was an average amount about, of about $1.3 million per university across Australia. So um, we also... Um, calculated how much uh, universities could save when you know students pull out of courses, you know, due to um, unpaid course fees or um, additional expenses um, in, the, in that way. So we valued our subscription service as, as, at about three hundred thousand per year in order to make that saving yeah. for the university. To add to that, uh, usually I would say for the counseling services, they actually spend from fifty dollars to one fifty dollars per each counseling session. We have considered the least amount and the number of students, and we came up to the, you know, uh, the, the the target market, which we are requiring. So, do you see your product as a complement to the current services, not a replacement for the current services that are offered? Um, uh, the product is not; um, it, it doesn't replace the counselling services. We are just trying to assist uh, the students to actually find a way to get the counselling. Most of the people, uh, students do not know if there is counseling services and do not know how to get over there. So it is a enabled chatbot that will ease a student to make them feel like uh, they are connected and they will find a mentor from the university who are rated by university itself and who can actually communicate them in their own language and empathize with them. Uh, just to add to the point that is being mentioned, um, I'm an international student myself. And uh, you know, um, I underwent um, a lot of turmoil in the first few weeks of my school. And um, you know, the fact that we are culturally different, the upbringing is extremely different, it takes a while for us to talk to people. And um, um, like Nirdesh mentioned, um, you know, we are from countries where opening up is a really, really a big thing. So, um, you know, so um, I used to kind of play around with the Google Assistant on my own phone just to kind of ask it to say some jokes and things like that to just lighten up the moment. So I think this um, you know, is something that comes personally from me and you know, all of the international students are facing this issue. One of the most transcendent events of my life was when I discovered makeup. I was 12 years old when I started poverty. I, I was coming through a lot of changes in my body. They were not only emotional ones, but also physical ones. And all my hormones were making me break out. I was the only one in all my classroom that had acne. This was very painful for me. This was affecting my security. This was making me feel embarrassed and left out. I decided to try makeup in order to cover this up and be part of everyone again. And I went to, to buy like, my, my first set of makeup and it was very hard for me to choose because there are like so many options among the, the foundations and the eyeshadows and the concealers and it's just a lot. And I thought that this was going to be solved afterwards, but it was not. This was just the starting of a nightmare because I didn't know how to use it. I didn't have the skills and I was not aware of how hard it was to achieve one design look. She's not left alone. We have more than 1.2 million Valera-like users in Australian market. And they spend more than $100, $100 on an year, average in other platforms like us. And the beauty is uh, the market is so 
matured that this $100 they spent and the 1.2 million users that works around 120 million opportunity for all of us. And for us to get Valeria like users to become our customer, we spent $90 to get Valeria like customers and the lifetime value of Valeria like customer is close to $675, which is a huge opportunity for us to tap in this Australian market as the first market. <laughs> And one very interesting thing in Australia is the beauty is Australian government allows Valeria Lake users to work after 14 years. Valeria Lake users who is 14 years and above, they can work and earn the money. That gives an another opportunity that they are earning close to $4,000 on an average and they spend $1,000 only on beauty related services. So it's an exciting market for us. So here we are going to explain about the solutions which we are going to offer. We want to use technology to make, op uh, to make options around makeup available to users like Valeria. There are two crucial elements to our technology solution. We are going to use uh, AI-based personaliz personalization engine to make personalized makeup styles available to Valeria. So she doesn't have to go and try to adopt the styles of someone like Kim Kardashian on Instagram. She can select to choose makeup styles that enhance her own uh, face structure and her own beauty. The second element to our technology solution is an augmented reality uh, component to the app. What this augmented reality will do is give you an option to visualize your own face with the makeup style on it from three-dimensional space without the need to actually put it on you. So the technology solution allows you to offer different kinds of services too. While we keep the core IP aside, the technology solution allows you to have a five-minute routine, which is a hook for us. What the five-minute routine means is that it will prompt you with makeup styles that allow you to try it on within five minutes, not more, not less. It also has an option to select what are the ingredients that you have at home in your makeup kit and select the styles that can be uh, achieved using those uh, ingredients. We like to call that recipe. Right, so as you can see, uh, YouTube's one of our big uh, competitors. Uh, they really offer quite a lot of um, variety in the space, uh, but unfortunately, people struggle to sift through the range of content, and they often uh, can't find that something that's really personal to their style. The tutorials are often, like we said, step-by-step -step imitations, rather than addressing the, the personal design needs of the individual. There's a very small selection on online platforms like Udemy, um, they typically focus on really broad topics and they really lack that personalization. Additionally, they don't really offer any um, community engagement uh, and members that help encourage and motivate others. Uh, our initial target market, as you can see, is young Australian uh, women in high school with a disposable income of about $4,000 per annum. We plan on utilizing targeted online marketing strategies um, on Instagram and leverage new partnerships uh, with influence, influencers on that platform. Um, extending our initial market to additional locations is the uh, start of our growth expansion. Word of mouth and social media interactions are obviously going to play quite a big role in our peer adoption. Uh, we have future plans for additional revenue income streams, uh, such as monthly, monthly subscription, um, for personalized cosmetics sent to you every month. And we're also looking into B2B white labeling solutions for uh, bigger cosmetics. We have two additional features like we mentioned earlier to um, up the regular use of our app, like the three minute zero to ready in five minutes um, um, uh, tutorial and the mobile augmented reality uh, service for our pro plan. We have expertise in the technology differentiation space and we could let Navneet speak at length to this, which we can organize if you are very interested in the actual technology aspects. But what I'll do is I'll skip through to the next slide. What we want from you today is 500,000. 500,000 to invest in our AI personalization engine and the augmented reality applications. We look at that as the core business proposition from our offering, from our project, and we want to invest in it as quickly as possible. 
So we can use freely available content to train the models and start putting out a beta release in the next six months. Thank you. Well, as a mother of two of your target market, I can tell you they've got a lot more than $4,000 invested because they just come to their parents. Um, but it is very much about that influencer market, isn't it? So how are you going to convince the influencers to come with you? Because they all have their own platforms generally through these processes as well. So our initial, initial um, uh, strategy is to go straight to Instagram. There's quite a lot of young individuals that hang around there and um, quite a lot of influencers. Um, the main idea behind this is to get them on the platform as an additional avenue for themselves to get more exposure. They're re really um, regularly keen to, to actually you know, um, widen their influence. So that's kind of the value proposition we can give to them. In fact, we are thinking about partnering with them. And we are thinking about four or five uh, different person, uh, well, different partners that would be like the influencers, each one of them have a different style. So uh, you as an user can relate to one of those styles. You know that you want, let's say, a natural look. You always go for that one. So you can select, um, let's say, Mary, that she always uh, is giving different options. So you have like one look for school or one look for weddings or graduation parties, like it, it all, all depends on each one of them. Uh, really well done and certainly an interesting uh, proposal. There's a tendency to overuse technology terms and, and so I'm wondering about this AI personalization engine. Can you tell me exactly what the artificial intelligence is doing in your proposal? Oh, Seems our appendix has disappeared, so maybe Navneet can just uh, we'll just talk explain to Sorry, I thought we had slides on that. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, uh, doing a first version of the release beta release. Uh, what we are plan is we have uh, already uh, the we have an in content video recognition and image recognition expertise already in the technology. We could use it uh, because there are a lot of YouTube followers uh, who is following some or other uh, stylist uh, as a followers. Uh, so we can get uh, those in content video recognition uh, as, as a start and image recognition as a start. They can, the users can upload the image which they see, the celebrity images uh, in our platform to check, uh, to look alike, uh, that feel we can give. And, and also we can able to say, segregate the interest and we can able to take the uh, index of the YouTube, we can just process it on the uh, indexing and we get the uh, get that connected to the right users. Uh, this is one thing which we can start and do. And going forward, uh, we, we need to like, uh, this is what we propose. We, uh, we, when the user comes in, uh, we can able to recognize the user by seeing the facial face uh, and we, can, we are going to map this face with the uh, skin. We can do that with image classification and things like that. Uh, we can use uh, convolution. Okay. Uh, maybe, just to give it, just to give you context, uh, Navneet actually has a company right now. Your job. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.